Hello, friends. Let me tell you about our experiences developing a family estate, which we started doing 15 years ago. We've lived here year-round for 11 years and had a wedding here 13 years ago in 2007. This elm was planted that year by our friend, a huge tree that is amazingly perfect to look at. In 2007, it was a small twig, one might say, a mere blade of grass that turned into a tree such as this with huge roots. We love this place very much. I want to talk about our practical experiences. I see quite a lot of videos on the internet about family estates, which often place great emphasis on beauty, and I think it would be worth talking about the practice, about the thoughts that the creators had at the very beginning, and what it turned into in the end. What mistakes were made, what decisions were successful, what we have come to over the years. We will try to fit all that into a short video and illustrate literally two and a half thirds that have appeared over the years. I really hope this will be useful for those who plan or begin to build a family estate. These are the thirds we have suffered, in quotation marks of course about suffering, because we really love our site and I want to share my thoughts. We live in the Mishore swamps and this has its advantages. It is easy to dig a pond or a well, the surface is level with few slopes. Here we actually have one of the steeper sites, probably one meter rise from corner to corner. Our site is almost square, I'll draw it for you now. I'll be here at the blackboard drawing like a schoolboy. By the way, when we came to prepare the room, we found written, on the earth will be good, and other things that we erased, but decided to leave the phrase at the top. It is very suitable for our video, I think. The road to the side approaches here and enters this corner. Now I will draw the cardinal points. We drive in like this. On this side we have south, on this side we have north. That is, the sun shines on the side, this is how the sun shines from here. And it turns out we drive in from the southern corner. When we started to explore this step, there was such a desire, many people have it, to build a house somewhere deep in the side. And we built, well, probably here, our first house. We built it deeply inside, at the distance about 70 meters from the entrance. The site is forested, it was originally forested, and it turns out that we built a house in the middle. We had more meadows nearby, and it was planned to make a vegetable garden there, that is right here, right there, such a series of meadows. There are birches, pines, and quite a lot of willows around. The slope turns to the north, a slight slope, maybe 3-5 degrees, maybe even smaller, I don't know how to calculate exactly. They plowed in this direction before, when this land was collective farm fields. We have smooth furrows in this direction. The first mistake, or rather I take it as a mistake, although maybe it is a matter of taste and could be left as is, the fact is, we established ourselves deep in the side. 
And therefore, in winter, when we live all year round, we need to clean, to clean this 70 meters in the large area around the house, a bit around the house anyway, but 70 meters of the road needs to be cleaned up. If I go on business in winter, sometimes I need to go to Moscow in the morning, but it's been snowing, and I have to drive through the snow. It gets compact and by the end of winter accumulates a large thickness of snow. Of course I clean up some it later on, but in the spring you start to sleep. In the end, understanding this, we build a second house closer to the entrance and oriented it to the south. But with the second home it is already easier for us. We are already clear on the territory in front of the house and here already as it is necessary. And we park cars at the entrance. So this was the first mistake. In general, my story about the estate, about my practical experience, I split it into several categories. First, the layout and the initial development. These issues are interconnected. When I thought what to talk about, in many ways they overlap. I'll tell you about the pond. There was a whole series of mistakes connected to practical experience. We were lucky to find some of these things, so I'll talk about them separately. As for the construction side, to be honest, we probably made a million or a billion euros. We had no experience at the beginning. I can't tell everything, just some little things. It will be funny for those with construction experience. I say some general thoughts about building, what I found and uh, what I could advise. In general, this video is primarily to help people learn from our mistakes. Those who are thinking of creating a family estate or recently started. Look, this is a neighboring site. We had exactly the same overgrowth 15 years ago. That's what it's become. Some birches dried up, since they compete stridently with each other. The remaining birches have long trunks and only few higher branches. There are no large birches, but now let's compare with our site, what we got. We thinned out almost from the very beginning, and then I realized that I should have cut even more. Here are the birches we have, you can see. That is, they are simply many times larger, with many more branches. It's more pleasant for me to look at these birches than those suffering over there. Well, there are almost no large birches. I took up this piece of land in 2005 before I had met my wife. In the next year, 2006, I met my wife. In 2007, we had a wedding, and friends came to us and planted quite a lot of seedlings. Since the site is large, it was difficult to understand how to master it better. My spouse was more engaged in drawing a plan. We still have a large paper sketch somewhere where the layout is drawn. Of course, in the end, it, it all turned out completely differently. First of all, we decided to take on the hedge, because it was more clear uh, what to do with it. But some separate plantings were also made, for example, in apple orchard. That's this place. Here we have apple trees. And in, this, and in the same 2007 we started building a house, our first home. In 2009 we completed it and moved into it. Our eldest son was just born, and when he was two weeks old we moved. It was certainly a pretty extreme experience. We had no electricity or amenities. There was a well, here it is. Here is the well. In general, we begin to live here and begin to settle down. 
We've lived here year round for 11 years now. We moved in May 2009. We have been developing our estate for 15 years. Although in 2005 and 2006 little was done, we just visited our land. This is in brief the timeline of the development of the site. Let's now look in more detail, point by point. The first thought I would like to express is that it was difficult for me, living in the city at that time, when I took up this piece of land in 2005. In 2006 I lived in Moscow, I came here periodically and had a plan to read and study literature in winter and figure out how best to develop the site. I can now say that it did not work very well for me. Based in the city, it is hard to understand what is happening on your land. When you start to leave, when you see how snow melts in spring, where the water goes, how the site looks in general, what grows where, after a certain number of years you start to feel what is happening on your land. Then it becomes easier to organize the plantings. Based on this experience, I would advise to start slowly, step by step, that is, to start with what is more or less clear. But, by the way, if you are planning a wedding, it is a very good chance to advance development of the estate. We will show you in more detail on the site. We warmly remember those plantings which friends made for us, and it all works really well. In general, the best place to start is, for example, the hedge, maybe also some kind of general layout, where you'd like to place the pond, where the household zone will be, and maybe start the garden plantings. Unless, of course, you are very good at gardening, and you already have experience, maybe at the Dutch or wherever, then of course it will be easier for you, you can do it all faster. But if you don't have this experience, start gradually. Over the course of several years you will become more and more confident about the what, how and where. At least it's our experience. Our site was initially very heavily forested. There were a number of meadows on it, but there were places completely inaccessible. I believe we made a serious mistake at the start and wasted our efforts idling. We started building our estate, focusing on the cleared meadows. We built a house on one of the meadows, planted apple trees at the wedding in 2007. The apple orchard went into a meadow, but there were already birches around here. Even behind the house I built, there were a lot of birches. Eventually I cut them all because they were in the way. But I needed an annex to the house and realized I'd have to cut birches. We began to make garden beds somewhere around here. We put a greenhouse there, not far from the apple orchard. Here's the greenhouse, and somewhere around it were garden beds in different places. I'll draw them roughly here somewhere, and there in the middle too. Somewhere else here we even tried making garden beds. It became clear that to continue gardening vegetable here, either we needed to clear all the trees, or we needed to move the garden somewhere else. Given this mistake, again, I would highly recommend, on a forested plot like ours, do not be limited to the clear meadows for planting fruit and vegetable gardens. Better to look into the future and try to foresee that if you leave the forest in the northern part of the site, it will create more shade every year. 
You will have to remove trees, which is not good. I will tell you more later about the layout we came to. But in general, don't focus on the clearance. We decided to move the vegetable garden, orchard and household area to the southern half of our site. We began to plant a new garden, protected from the north by the forest. The garden grows along the edge of the forest. Then we have vegetables slightly to south and a pond. Now I'll show you how it looks here. Here is one of the main thoughts about forest areas and the whole estate, because trees will eventually grow all over it. It is better to leave the northern half of the plot under forest, maybe two thirds, maybe less. In, in the beginning, on cleared land, it may be even harder to see how to lay everything out. Don't be confused. Look ahead to how it will look overall after a certain number of years, at least in five. 10 years and especially in the following decades. Think what it will look like and do everything so that the different parts don't interfere with each other but help. Likewise about the house. We built a house deep in the side as we wanted privacy and comfort. But since I have to travel on business, it turned out to be very inconvenient in winter. When you need to go somewhere early in the morning and all night it was snowing and there is 70 meters of road to be cleared of snow, it's quite difficult. So we built our main house near the entrance and we have enough privacy there. That's all probably, despite the fact that it is very close to the road. Well, yes, it suits us now. Еще, 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 давайте. Ай, молодцы. <laughs> and this is really good. I think it. Over the time, we came up with a simple layout. I'll draw it for you now. We just divided the site diagonally. This is the northern part of our site, with the forest. And this is the southern part of the site, where we find the household area, gardening and living area. And pond also. The original duck pond here, closer to, close to the neighbor. I'll tell you about the pond in more detail later. Here we made a vegetable garden next to the pond, and behind the garden we have a hilly ridge. I will tell you about this in more detail a little later. I am now talking about the general layout. Here is a garden strip. The idea was that when we plant a garden at the edge of the forest, then it is protected from the north winds and high trees won't overshadow the garden. All the sun comes to our garden planting. Here and here we try gardening. I'm drawing just a little plan. 
Here's a garden area. For more detail, we have a playground here, and here some cherries are planted. Here we began to plant apple and pear trees. We came to a rather important thought that the layout was originally supposed to look something like this. But the fact that we settled so deep in this site, I think it is a mistake. Although it is clear that this might be good for somebody, it's a matter of taste, but for us it turned out not quite right. Although we were also very comfortable in this, there are pluses as well. We were remodeling the pond. In the beginning we dug a pond before knowing the ducks by Zeb Holzer, before knowing his experience in constructing ponds. As I joke all the time, our first pond looked like an explosion crater. It was a pit with an earth rim in the form of a horseshoe. We moved the soil a distance away from the pond, but we have a wet spring and high groundwater, so the soil got washed back into the pond. The remaining hills not washed away are still here. Nevertheless, we have a pond and the high ground water made it quickly fill. It was very useful in summer when working in the heat. Of course, you want to swim and luckily you have a pond nearby. Go swimming and immediately you are rested, rebooted and you can continue to work. It was great. Later, when Holzer's books appeared, it became clear that you can do something more interesting with this soil, and not just leave it here next to the pond. We made a significant mistake and later tried to rectify it. We actually buried a lot of fertile soil instead of saving it aside. At first we did not think about it, nor guess what to do. Firstly, from the place where we dug the pond, from this surface, all the soil went simply into a heap. Secondly, at the places we heaped the earth, we accidentally buried fertile soil. Later we learned about the ideas of Zeb Holzer, about pond construction, terracing, and so on. Another interesting idea from him is the so-called soil traps. He has several of them, crater gardens and sand traps. Another idea, move soil from the pond and derage it in the form of a ridge. Let's look at this idea, we have done it here. Here I'm pointing to south, it turns out that this is a solar trap. It is in the form of a horseshoe, not very curved and directed to south. Here we have planted vegetables between the ridge and the pond. The ridge also acts as a windbreak, protecting the vegetable garden from the cold northern winds. Plus the forest also protects from the wind. When we made the ridge, we tried to save a fertile topsoil. We collected it and later spread it on the ridge on the horizontal terraces. Our ridge is about 2 meters high. Holzer, however, recommends making the ridge 3 meters high, so it is it fully protects against the wind. Still, two meters is better than nothing. We made flat terraces on our ridge in the middle and top of the slope. As well as protecting the garden from cold northern air, the ridge can be used for planting heat loving plants. We are trying to do this, as you can see. The slopes warm up better than flat land. land. When we did this earthwork, we also enlarged the pond a little, remodeled it. We made a separate beach here because soil was removed, leaving the spot free. 
you can approach the pond from the different sides, but we made the beach for small children. And we did another important job in my opinion, we changed the slope of the land in the garden. The fact is that our entire site has a slight slope to the north in that direction. But next to the pond it became clear that we needed to make a slope to the south, otherwise water would accumulate at the ridge when snow melts or heavy rains fall. Another advantage is that the south-facing slope improves soil heating from the sun. There is a technique using triangular beds that is relevant for our Vladimir region, which is not the warmest region. This is a big plus for the garden, that the soil here should warm up better. The result is a whole complex, consisting of a pond, a vegetable garden and a ridge. This was quite a good decision in my opinion. I won't say that we get huge harvests, but overall I am happy with how we did it. Maybe I would make a bigger pond now, so that more valuable fish can be grown there. We have crucians breeding there actively, but it would be possible to launch carp or some other fish. Our pond is not very deep, up to 3-4 meters, depending on the water level in, in the current year. By the way, it's uh, interesting to think about the best place to dig a pond. I have an idea of where it would be good to dig bigger pond, but I don't understand what to do with the complex of the pond, garden and ridge that we use here. I could have dug a pond to the north, somewhere closer to the forest, maybe in that corner where it is pretty wet and it is possible to dig a pond at the edge of the forest. But then, beyond the pond, it is already the forest, nearly the boundary, and we can't do the rich combination there. It is quite an interesting task for those who are going to plan their land, think about how to place each of the elements together. It is clear that the pond, for example, is conveniently located. Next to the vegetable gardens or water is close for irrigation, it's just perfect, isn't it? Here is, here is another element we created. We did an overall redevelopment from that house, which is in the back of the side. We moved closer to the south, closer to the entrance, and moved all our house, household activities to the new vegetable garden and orchard. We moved to the southern half of the site, and gardens in the clearance in the northern part will eventually grow over. We included a new garden in the same complex. You can see it here, but there are hills of land behind the ridge, which is the remaining fertile topsoil after various earthworks. We poured the fertile soil in the form of hills at a certain distance and plant apple trees on them. According to experience of several neighbors in our area, better to plant seedlings on hills, although Ole Zhurbina from Vidrusia in Krasnodar region told me the same thing. She said that according to her experience in the Kuban, where it is much warmer, it is also grows much better on the hills. They make little hills and trees begin to grow noticeably better. Maybe this is even some kind of universal recipe from for different regions. This is definitely relevant for us since the groundwater is closed. Therefore, apple and pear trees are best planted on hills. And it turns out the garden also became an element of this complex, which includes a pond, a vegetable garden, a ridge and even a forest, along the edge of which there is a long strip of garden. Therefore, it will be protected by the forest from the north wind winds.
Construction is a very delicate and broad topic. In taste and color there are no cameras, as the saying goes. I will tell you the thoughts we came to, with my wife, of course. What are my thoughts about construction? At the very beginning, our first house, which is smaller, we built it towards the back of our plot. It's just a f frame house, I didn't have any experience, money was tight at that time and I could not hire builders who would build the house the way I wanted. Frame technologies are convenient in this regard, because there is much you can do yourself. Anyway, my, my friends helped me a lot, but I did l a lot myself in this house. And seems to me I did a huge amount of mistakes. It's even a shame to talk about some of them. Nevertheless, we lived in this house for uh, eight, and five, eight and a half years before we moved to our new home, where we have been living for uh, two and a half years. But the old house still functions and we are re renting it out. One of my main thoughts is that it is better to use proven technologies for building a house. There are a lot of experience, experiments in our settlement, a wide range of building technologies. Of course, there are many factors to consider, for example, your budget. In principle, you can choose the construction technology at practically no cost, for example, from clay with wood, minimal cost but a lot of labor efforts. And this has its own charm, if your hands grow from the right place. But not everyone was so lucky, and I personally came to the conclusion that if I was going to build another house, then I would build it from blocks. For example, I like the construction technology using wood concrete. In terms of its fire safety and structural reliability. And I would prefer at least for the first floor, though it may be better to limit construction to one floor, bearing in mind the large areas of our plots, although both our houses have two floors, I would make the floor an insulated concrete slab. Because when you start living then, unexpected nuances of operation may become clear. In the first house, for example, I have a wooden floor, under it is a heater and linoleum above. In our experience, if there are children in your house and they need to be bathed or they carry water in cups, then the probability that sooner or later water will flow under the, lino the linoleum is almost 100%. And we have a place where the water leaked and the boards under the linoleum began to rot. And it's amazing how fast pine boards rot closed without air access. For example, if you throw a board on the grass outside, then it can lay for quite a long time, maybe five, seven years, and it will not rot to the end. And if you lift it above the ground, blown with air, it will serve twice as long, but if you wear the board and put it in a plastic bag, then in two, three years there will be not a board, but rubbish. Similarly, covering the floorboard with linoleum on top and the bottom with insulation, we actually put this board in a plastic bag. Well, if you make a concrete floor, there, there will be no such problems. You can pour water as if into a pool, then dry it and no problem. Another important thought, to which I would advise you to pay attention, at least this is our experience, and I emphasize this again, I originally planned that the first house would be temporary. We will live in it for several years and build later a bigger house. I don't really know what I was counting on at the very beginning, because building a house is very expensive, and I had lack of money for my first house. But then, this is how fate turned out, that money appeared, and we were able to build another house. 
What could you do with the first house? Well, someone is building a bathhouse as a residential building and initially live in it. Build the main house later and the bath begins to be used for its intended purpose. Or you make a living room over the bath. Different approaches can be applied here. We built a house and originally thought that maybe the parents will leave with us or friends will visit us. Now this is seen as, as a very irrational approach. And I would advise, if you choose a concept like this, to build a house, implying that it will turn into hostel, where you will house tourists. At the moment, this, this idea seems to me very reasonable, and especially now, during a pandemic, when in our settlements practically all available houses were rented out, because it was hard for families with children to live in apartments without working outside. Many people came from Moscow or Vladimir. So real, I realized that if I were thinking now about what house should I build first, understanding that in a few years I will move out of it, then I would make a townhouse, consisting of two parts. My family could use the whole thing at first, and I would search or come up with a plan so that it can be subsequently divided into two parts. It is possible to make two entrances or one common entrance with a vestibule and two doors inside. And then you get like two hotel rooms. In my opinion, this is a very reasonable idea for the future. For such a house it would be better to use past resistant technologies. As I said, wood floors can rot very quickly if covered with linoleum or laminate. If you rent a house to tourists, then you may have problems. You yourself will care about the building. The guests won't be so worried. So here are my brief thoughts on the construction side, because I don't see any point in going deeper. The topic is endless, a huge number of nuances. Although I'll say one more third. I have a small bathhouse located next to the pond. Honestly, I afterwards came to the idea that in a big house we have about 150 square meters, I would think about making a bath or sauna inside the house, if you are making a big house even just to save resources in construction and heating. A separate bath is very expensive. Of course, our bathhouse is simple, we built it cheaply, but nevertheless it is labor-intensive. Allocate some room in the house for a sauna. Let it be 2 by 2 meters, you can choose a room and put a small stuff in it. You hit the whole house and this room will be warm. It for sure will not freeze. If you have conveniences in the house, then this also lets you remove wastewater from the bath into the sewer. And that's all. Your problem is solved. If, if I start it over, I would probably do it like this. Now let's talk about the cellar. We had quite a successful experience. I think the cellar is a very important building in the family estate. Because as soon as you reach the point where your orchard is growing and apple harvests increase to a, not to a noticeable amount, then they need to be put somewhere. In addition, you'll collect carrots, beetroot, potatoes and other vegetables and roots. What to do with all this? If you store it in the house, then it is clear that quickly everything will go bad. Since we have high groundwater, I raised the floor of the cellar. The cellar is made of bricks. A meter high concrete strip sits under it as a foundation. 
The foundation begins half a meter below ground level and goes half a meter above. Here you can see that the ground is raised. Let's take a look inside the cellar. Vaulted ceilings can be seen in the cellar. There are two rooms. A vestibule was, ma was made so that in winter when it's uh, minus 30 degrees outside, frosty air does not enter the cellar. It's cut off in the vestibule. Plus we have passive supply ventilation made on whole source advice, which he recommends to everyone. I have two pipes underground about 17 meter long. One pipe comes to one room, another pipe to another room. We have been using the cellar for about five or seven years and very satisfied. There are small flaws here and there, I'll try to tell about them too. Our cellar is three to five meters, consisting of two rooms. Now if uh, you look from above, it looks like this. Here we have a small entry room and two lines, like a beetle moustache. Now I'll tell you the point. We placed a meter high concrete strip, footing along this contour. Half a meter underground, half a meter above the ground. Above normal ground level. By the way, here again, when we started building, it was very careful with the... I was very careful with the fertile so topsoil. We covered the cellar with earth after building. I estimated the base area of the piled heap of earth and we removed the topsoil from this area. We used the topsoil to make heaps for fruit plantings. Before we started building, the excavator basically placed, placed clay here inside the foundation. He made us a clay floor, by the way you can make a concrete one, which is more practical in some senses. The excavator smoothed the clay to the top level of our meter strip footings. It put and leveled and then we started building bricks, brick walls. We made uh, one and a half bricks thick, a wall this thick. At first we made a vertical wall, in section it looks something like this. It is a vaulted cellar, this is a cross section. I made a wall to improve air flow in the cellar. If done with square form, then in the corners the air stagnates. It's a well-known topic, mold appears there due to high humidity in the cellar. It's best if the, if the cellar has no right angles in which the air stagnates. Even better, of course, as in monasteries in general, vaulted ceilings such as tetrahedral. We don't have such corners, but we have almost no mold or, or mild dew in the cellar. Every year we process the cellar with a sulfur block once we've finished the potatoes and apples. We'll do it just now in August. The vaulted ceiling has worked very well. Vaulted ceilings are very solid. It was, I was still worried because to build this cellar was quite expensive. I was worried that when the excavator started our clay soil would fall in lumps on top, damaging the structure. In this sense, a vaulted ceiling is more reliable. I made two rooms because, for example, it is better not to store apples and potatoes together. This is a well-known topic. Here we store potatoes, beets, carrots, and here we store apples. By the way, our apples are preserved until May. The cellar has proven itself very well. Another thing, our floor is just clay backfill. When we made the foundation, before building, it was filled with an excavator inside with clay and smoothed out. There is a little higher in the middle here, with a slope off to the sides. I studied this especially, even went to one conference where some guys presented about Zeb, Zeb Halter's experience. He makes town cellars in the Austrian Alps. I 
have not done mining quite the same way, but some ideas I got from Zeb Holzer. For example, we made ventilation. Usually ventilation is either wind-forced, wind-forced or fan-driven, driven, driven air inside somehow. Or you can have ventilation through the door, air simply enters through the cracks in the door. But imagine in winter it's uh, minus 30 or minus 35 and frosty air enters the cellar. It's not very good. We equipped passive ventilation according to Zeb Holzer, which should look like this. You bury pipe underground. Ideally, it should be at least 10 meters long. Underground with a slight upward slope. The slope is the same standard slope as for septic tanks, 2 cm per meter. And your pipe goes to the cellar. It comes up and should start from some little gully, or some kind of sloping ground, not from a pit. In principle, you can make it uh, 2 meters or even 30 meters long, but you don't need much more. The point is that winter air from outside enters the pipe and as it rises up, then it slowly begins to warm up and you have an influx of warm air. Under the ground the pipe must be below the freezing depth, it didn't get it that deep, but I had no other choice because our site has practically no slope. So the pipe had to come out at the shore of the pond. It's not very good in summer, as the cellar receives excess moisture, but on the other hand the cellar is not so important in summer. It is important in winter, when the harvest needs to be preserved. You put it away in fall, so it won't get frozen in winter, but is preserved properly. The temperature was low, and in winter there was snow on the pond, so whichever gully the pipe comes out makes no difference. In this sense, the solution turned out uh, all right. Where the pipe enters the cellar, I buried two pipes. That's how they are located. By the way, it is important to make the entrance from the north, so that the sun doesn't shine and warm up the cellar through the door. The sun shines from here. Two pipes, one into each room. Then we raise the pipe with the knee joint. Our earthen floor is made with a slope away to the sides, slightly higher in the middle and downward slope to the sides, so that any water can drain. Here you see that notched pipes are laid around the perimeter. You could do usual ventilation in a simple way. In the wall, for example, event, but air will flow in just one place. Notched pipe is the way, is the way for the air to circulate more evenly around the entire perimeter and throughout the space. Air comes in here, and then it starts to come out along the walls all around. Now you have fresh air everywhere in the cellar. To summarize, we've used it more than five years, and it has proven itself perfectly. In winter the inside temperature drops to plus one, plus two. I made the vestibule to cut off the frosty air. When the temperature is very low, the walls are covered with ice. But inside the cellar ice doesn't form. Here's the door and one more door to cut off the cold. Nothing freezes in the cellar and it is stored well. Here the apples, as I said, last until May, depending on the variety. Some apples we keep spoil before May 80%, maybe, but some part remain, remains and we still eat them. There are some apples that last very well and spoil little. 
Our potatoes in mid-July are still last years. We cut off with sprouts, so they don't germinate so too strongly. We don't eat them ourselves, but feed them to chicken. The cellar works fine, of course. I made it big enough to solve from the start the question of preserving the crop for the future. As for the design of the shelves, they can be done in different ways. You can see how we did, did it. There are large compartments at the bottom, so bags can be stuffed. Top shelves for jars and boxes. On the whole, we are satisfied. They made them out of metal to serve longer, and some wooden shelves, plain pine. Of course, building such a cellar is not a cheap pleasure, but I hope it will last a very long time. I think it won't be buried for a while yet, and it will last for several generations. We had some negative experiences in the settlement. Guys made cellars from wood, namely from pine, which we have most commonly. I know a lot of people have already complained that it's very short-lived, no matter how you treat it with antiseptics. I know from my construction experience what happens to a pine wood. When it gets wet and cannot dry out, it turns to dust in a matter of few years, literally. If you want wood, then do it from oak. Zeb Holter talks about this too. It still works if you make from oak, but it only lasts 30 years. With pine it's less than 10 years, most likely even less, 7 years. In the last years you will go to the cellar wondering whether the ceiling will fall on your head or not. Well, I'll do that at least. Here I thought about the centuries, I would like to hope so. Very reliably, yes it looks, very reliable. Hopefully. Great, thank you. You are welcome. Another broad topic is the settlement. To be honest, I am a little lost, because this topic is very broad. This issue needs to be prepared separately. The question is very important, of course very important, because we see in the example of our community of settlements, when people unite, when they build common infrastructure, when they celebrate holidays, when it greatly improves the quality of life. This is Dobro Zimlia kind land where we are now. It turned out to be a very large project. I stood at its origins too. How many good things happened here and still will happen. Uh, organization of settlements, in my opinion, is one of the key questions. The most important question, sometimes even maybe more important than developing your own plot, in a sense. Of course, my own estate is always more dear to me, but I'll say a few simple thoughts about the settlement as a whole. What I have come to. Maybe sometime, someday more thoughts will arrive and I'll tell you more what I think. Our community of settlements initially went along the anarchic path. Our issues of joint decision-making were arranged very simply. At first we did not even agree on how we make decisions. We just have two meetings a year, and we solve issues only about roads. Cleaning them in winter and repairing them in summer. So we, the issue of road maintenance has been well handled since the roads were built. As far as I can see in new settlements, at least from what I heard, I see some people coming up with a little different strategy. They try to construct a community from the beginning. They take it seriously from the start, not like us who simply settled next to one another expecting everything to be great. We went along that path at first. Although in the end, as practice shows, passionate people settled here who try to, go to do good stuff. 
so it didn't turn out so badly. But I would start with the experience of other settlements who thought from the start about how to create a community. Here are examples from old settlements. Kavchek means the Ark. It's a good example where they created from the start powerful shared infrastructure. Up to now, Kavchek has been one of the more advanced settlements, visited by many media outlets and with a bunch of interesting projects. Well done! It's an example to follow of a settlement where a school was established. I also heard more than once about Lisnaya Palana settlement, Forest Glade. I have not been there yet. Yet, I hope it happens. I would like to get there someday and carefully study their experiences. Dimo Vatorin from Kavchek told me a lot about Lisnaya Palana, about their workday system, which began at the foundation of the settlement. Their traditional our custom is that monthly, as I understand it. Each state gives one working day to the development of the common infrastructure. This does not seem a lot, but if you count uh, 12 months of the year multiplied by the number of estates, you get a huge number of working hours. The main thing is that this work does not stop, if it continues from year to year, which allows them to do a lot in terms of infrastructure. For us, it is pretty difficult already. We had some conflicts in the settlements, and it's quite difficult to organize even one joint working day. Of course, it is very sad. Therefore, we need to think and study this experience. And when building a settlement, be sure to think over how to create common infrastructure and build a community. How will you make decisions? At least, as experience shows, as people know at the circles of settlements, everyone has conflicts. We are people, what should we do? One thinks it should be like this, another thinks it should be like that, but to the third it seems different again. There is always a reason to be offended by someone, to think that everyone is doing everything wrong. In general, this goes for everyone, even at Kavchek and Lesnaya Poliana. Everyone has it. You can't avoid it, but at least in all settlements there is a period during the first few years, like a honeymoon. And during this honeymoon one can lay traditions of cooperation, lay down the general infrastructure, that you later will be able to use and further develop. If this is not done, maybe there won't be this addition of powers, although sometimes with luck a community develops without it. I think it has been more or less successful with us. We have a number of projects besides Dobro Zemlya. We have the House of creative, Creativity and Active Sports Grounds at London Settlement. There are several attractions and people visit for holidays. I know that compared to some settlements, this is nothing, at least according to the stories of their inhabitants. It's hard there with that. Well, what else do we have? I basically said everything. Well, I hope if you got this far, you were wondering about something I mentioned. You didn't go to watch some other video. This video is our first attempt. Sasha and I are trying to take the first steps and hope that it will be a series of videos about the practical experience of our neighbors in the development of their family estates. We are still practicing on ourselves. We started with my family estate and we'll continue with Sasha's in the next video. Please help us understand how to do it better. We look forward to your comments. Well, what's this? Love and affection? The doggy came. We are waiting for, a, for your comments about what you liked and what you didn't like. Perhaps we missed something that would be worth talking about. What would you be interested in? You write, please, and we will try to take this into account in the next videos. 
We'll read and think about it. It's an experiment for us. We don't know how it will turn out yet. I really hope you find this helpful. All the best.